Hello, this is Joshua Shooping again. I wanted to return to continue sharing a little bit on an important subject that uh, I found as I was um, uh, leaving the Eastern Orthodox Church. Some of the things that I found uh, somewhat disturbing, as some of you may know, I had uh, studied and uh, written on um, issues related to theosis and to prayer of the heart. And so this particular uh, video, this talk, We'll be discussing a, a, a fairly popular and well-respected book, focusing especially on a particular chapter in uh, The Watchful Mind, Teachings on the Prayer of the Heart. It was written in the mid-19th century, I believe it was 1851, um, by a hieromonk. A hieromonk is a priest monk, and I uh, just want to share some of the uh, things that are found in here so that uh, for those who are evangelical and are perhaps uh, considering entering into the Eastern Orthodox Church, who are being told certain things uh, by Eastern Orthodox priests or on certain Eastern Orthodox websites or YouTube presentations about what Orthodoxy is. I uh, am hoping to just be one small, uh, lone little voice here, um, just saying something uh, alternate, alternative to, to kind of the mainstream message about Eastern Orthodoxy. It still exists in a kind of exotic space within the American uh, Christian world uh, and the Western Christian world, the English speaking Christian world. So that a lot of times, uh, unfortunately, it seems almost that it's still not being uh, seriously examined uh, with a critical eye from evangelical scholars, seeing the threat to the gospel, seeing uh, the numbers of people that are being uh, drawn into the Eastern Orthodox system. Um, it's one of the reasons why I'm even doing these videos um, you know, just occasionally I'll just see pictures of, of numbers of people uh, becoming Orthodox Christian and, and um, it just weighs very heavy on my heart. Uh, typically these people are very well read. They, some of them might even, even have been well taught um, in, in their tradition. And, and yet often when these people present information about the tradition they come from, an evangelical tradition they come from, it's often very poorly informed. It's, it's often not historically informed about what even actual evangelical positions are. And so as they enter into the Orthodox Church, they're often very enamored by the, it's huge. The Eastern Orthodox Church is huge because of the, of, of, you know, the, the scope of history that it deals with. So you could read Irenaeus, uh, Athanasius, um, Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory Nazianzus, Basil, and you could read and study authors like this, Maximus, you read the, the, the big names, and maybe you read modern works by authors like Callistos Ware or Alexander Schmemann or uh, Romanides, and you get kind of this, this sort of idea that orthodoxy is what it's made to seem. And unfortunately, there are realities within the Orthodox Church that aren't very uh, often discussed or brought to light. And so I feel it's my responsibility. Uh, hopefully this will allow the pure gospel, the simple gospel, uh, the gospel of, of, of salvation in Christ as a free gift of his grace received by, by faith is, is um, at, at threat is threatened by the Orthodox teaching. And so people, you know, have their assumptions as they go in and they think that they'll kind of preserve those things. Um, but unfortunately it's, it's not possible, but without further ado, we'll get into, uh, the, the watchful mind here. We're in the foreword and the recommendation by an abbot from Mount Athos, which is where this book's um, provenance uh, uh, originates or where it comes from originally is is Mount Athos and an abbot of the of a, a monastery there says uh, quotes from here give blood in order to receive the spirit and we'll kind of find out kind of what that means here uh, looking at discourse one uh, on page 42 we'll see that this book is is actually filled with some good and some bad and uh, unfortunately, the bad is so bad, I, I thought it was worthwhile to bring to your attention. But, but I wouldn't want to say that it's all bad. Other, otherwise, how would it be persuasive? How would it uh, persuade people that it has uh, legitimacy if it was just, you know, always frothing at the mouth uh, with madness? It's not. And so it'll say things that like one should pray constantly, right? That's, that's, a, that's a good teaching. We should pray without ceasing. That comes from 1 Thessalonians 5, to, to pray without ceasing. But it also says things like that we should pray with contrition of heart. 
which is again, that's also a, a good teaching. We we should we should have compunction. We should feel sorrow and and remorse and regret for for our sin. And yet, then it also adds this unusual concept and force. We should pray with force. Um, and uh, but one should indeed pray constantly, even if they can't do it with force. Um, if, for example, someone is praying forcefully and with contrition of heart, and his chest begins to ache inside so much that it cannot take anymore, let him then pray with less force. So here we see this teaching within this book about this idea of praying with internal force. And as we'll see, this isn't a metaphorical or a figurative idea of force. It's very, very physical. It's very, very physical. Let him then pray with less force and in a still moderate and restful manner until the inner wounded place of the chest has healed and recovered. So this is the idea that, that one should pray with such internal physical force that they should actually, essentially you would just be internally sensing that you have some kind of wound in your heart. And some people will say, well, why are you sharing this advanced teaching? Um, I don't believe that there are advanced teachings in the church of Jesus Christ that he established that would cause a person to hurt themselves for de spiritual development that would require uh, internal wounding uh, with physical pain. Um, that's a form of spiritual abuse. And so that's why I caution against, you know, even trying to frame books like this or teachings like this within the Orthodox uh, uh, framework as advanced. Uh, no, it's, it's debased. It's not advanced. So once healed and recovered from this wound of internally pressurizing and forcing oneself, let a person then resume the struggle of his contrite prayer of the heart as before with force. Okay, so we'll move forward here. Bearing his chest, this is Discourse 2, page 51. Bearing his chest and saying from the depths of his heart, this is how it was revealed to him to, to pray this way. It's uh, seeing such a desire to pray. God sent the brother, uh, his angel, while he slept. So whether this is a brother or an angel, um, um, well, it, it's, it's a human because as we'll see, he's spitting up blood. Angels don't have blood. So bearing his chest and saying from the depths of his heart, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. The angel showed the brother with exactness and precision all the signs of the noetic prayer of the heart. That is to say, when the angel spoke the prayer, the brother saw the force the angel used. He saw that from such internal force, the angel sweat and spit blood and greatly troubled his heart. And that he was greatly attentive to the prayer. So, so this is with such force that a person is actually to spit up blood. That's what this teaching teaches. The angel then said to the brothers, say the prayer in the way that you saw me saying it, and your, your soul will find rest. Rest is not in Christ. Rest is in the forcefulness of this prayer. Um. Moving forward, let's see. The all-wise God wants those who sweat and greatly struggle out of their love for noetic prayer to receive the gift of noetic prayer and noetic contemplation, just as one of the fathers said that he employed so much force to finally acquire the prayer within himself that he spit much blood. He spit much blood. I hope that's as shocking to you as it is to me this is published by uh, saint vladimir's seminary press mainstream uh orthodox teaching from you know uh, in america and in the english language but also from being from mount athos it, it also is is being portrayed as this is orthodox spirituality moving forward this is in discourse five uh perhaps our key discourse here that we'll spend most of our time in where it says if you do not receive tears when you force your heart with the prayer, know that you have not attained pain of heart. Why we should want pain of heart is, is somewhat self-evident to these authors at this point. You have not yet reached the point of wounding your heart so much that the place where the prayer is being said aches with a sharp pain, as if that place of the chest 
were being stabbed with a sharp knife. There is a difference between the person who prays with pain of heart, saying the prayer from the center of the pain, and the person who prays simply from his heart without pain of heart and without wounding the heart and without the inner knife of the chest. So this is idealizing this inner stabbing pain this pr and praying from that pain, that that pain becomes like an essential part of what it means to pray. Uh, he continues, but when the tears cease, because this is supposed to also be accompanied with much with profuse tears, if the pain inside you remains strong and the wound is still open, without the tension of the pains being relieved, without the wounds being healed, and without the hearts immediately recovering, you will again be able to acquire tears when you want to. So this is this idea of being able to, to have this sort of fresh pain all of the time or with it maybe being slightly... Um, uh, 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 abated to some degree so that, that the tears cease, but the pain remains strong and the wound is open, that this is a good state because it allows you to be able to return uh, to, to being able to pray with tears. Physical tears are uh, almost a necessity, and you might find that in some other fathers, the, the necessity of tears. And so after the shedding of tears, the insensitivity your soul has suffered departs, uh, the hopelessness you felt for your salvation is banished. So we see that this is about assurance of salvation, that they find assurance of their salvation in these psychophysiological responses of tears uh, and pain of chest. So this, this whole system is sort of uh, arranged as kind of like a deceptive assurance. It's, it's basically just like a devotional uh, neoplatonic a Christianized kind of uh, asceticism. It's, uh, it's 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 challenging to read. It, at first, it, it gave me, I have to say, anger to to read some of these things, and then it gave me great sorrow. Uh, the amount of of spiritual delusion, uh, prelest, um, that's really it's a famous concept in Orthodox spiritual circles. This idea of prelest, but but when you read even their own works, you find you know the the, the presence, the strong presence of spiritual delusion. Prelest means spiritual delusion or obsession. And let's see, God granted you these tears, still in Discourse 5, now on page 78. God granted you these tears as a small consolation, as a pledge of the heavenly kingdom. Uh, because you did not offer him a sacrifice of whole burnt offerings, which he does not desire, as it says etc. A sacrifice to God is a crushed spirit, a broken spirit. We find this uh, teaching here uh, throughout associated with what it means in Psalm 51 to have a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Um, they're, instead of saying broken, they're saying a crushed spirit. So th that's what this pain is. They're associating this pain with, with a crushed spirit. So the intense pain, it, it continues, that has seized you and that you feel inside and the blood you spit on account of the force of the prayer of the heart are considered by God to be an acceptable sacrifice. Um, horrid. But why do you feel pain in the center of your chest and not anywhere else? So we see that this is a physical pain, right? This isn't just spiritual pain, metaphorical pain, remorse, contrition over sin. It's it's actual physical pain. And why did the prayer interiorly cut your chest into pieces at that spot like a sharp knife? And why did you spit blood at times cold and black and at times warm and red? So they're spitting up sometimes cold and black blood, sometimes uh, warm red blood. It's, uh, it's shocking. These things happen to you, beloved. Because, because it was in that place of your chest that the blessed prayer mightily wrestled and did battle with the devil and his servants for the redemption and salvation of your soul. And so there's really no cross. The cross doesn't hasn't defeated Christ. It's not a matter of faith. It's just the faith would be faith to go to, to force yourself through this process of, of interior crushing and breaking of, of your heart. Uh, by with this stabbing physical pain. 
let's see um the devil uh or the excuse me the veil behind which the devil hides is found in the inner regions of the chest so again we see that it's it's both physical and spiritual continuing it should be noted that this veil is both spiritual and physical so we just it admits it very plainly and upfrontly that this is a, a spiritual and physical uh, reality that he's talking about. Um, if the veil, that screen of Satan, is not something physical, how is it possible for you to feel that your inner prayer has found it? So this this pain is actually helping a person, excuse me, to locate uh, this place where Satan resides. So this is like Satan dwelling within the heart. Now, this is ostensibly a Christian you know, somehow Satan has has is still in the heart and Satan has to be expelled through this process. Christ, we wonder what he has won for us at this point. Um, I, it seems like the, the cross, the, the resurrection, the ascension has done nothing but apparently made this possible. But still, all you still have to strive to the point of spitting up blood in order to be free of the presence of Satan in the heart. So we wonder what other Christians who don't go through this process would ever be able to experience from this paradigm, the paradigm presented in here. So and when you examine your depths, it continues, by the power, wisdom, and judgment of noetic prayer, you will discover both your inner and outer self. So the more you draw near to God by doing his holy commandments, the more you recognize just how far you are from God. And so this doesn't lead to uh, a repentance and a reception of God's grace. It leads to uh, the need to have assurance through this this process. Let's see. Do you see, beloved, how every evil comes from the heart when it has become the nest and dwelling place of Satan? So the, for him, the Christian heart is still a nest and dwelling place of Satan. That is where Satan stores all his evil seeds of wickedness and all the destructive contrivances of his trickery and evil upon which he lies as upon some soft mattress. But when the prayer reaches that place, this pain, you know, having followed this pain, this sharp stabbing pain, the home of Satan, and really shakes it up, Satan too is immediately shaken up and vexed, together with his evil angels, just as wasps are disturbed when you bother their nest. So a Christian is still a nest of Satan and unclean spirits. For that veil is the devil's signature, the record of sin. Lucifer's written confession where the devil has inscribed every sin. So this is this, this reference record of sin echoes like what Christ actually, when we read in Colossians, what he tore up, the record that was against us. So, so this basically goes back to and tries to live in a spiritual place prior to what Christ won on the cross, the tearing up of the records. If you tear that spiritual and physical veil of the devil and of yourself, by the force of the prayer of your heart, you will immediately erase all the sins that are written on it. So we erase, according to this paradigm, you yourself, you will immediately erase uh, by through this process all the sins that are written on it and bring to naught all the effort the devil has put into writing your evil deeds upon it. This just brings me such great sadness uh, to think that, that these people are confusing this with heightened and advanced spirituality. It's, it's just a complete abandonment of the gospel. Lord have mercy. Um, when you recognize the activity of Satan, you will be moved by divine zeal and strongly determined. You will say, either I will die this moment because of the extreme force of the prayer or the devil and his wiles will be banished and driven from my heart. This is how you destroy, obliterate, and tear down the devil's veil and tear it to pieces. Not grace, but it's through the extreme force of personal effort. And we just can't help but think of Galatians 3.3, 3, you know, oh foolish Galatians, uh, have you begun in the spirit and now you're going to be perfected by the flesh? This is why, he says, one spits blood from there, from the heart, because that is where he did violence to himself with the prayer, because that's where, remember, the devil still is in the heart of the Christian. So he has to have that knife force uh, pain in his heart so we can locate where that nest is, so we can stir it up, get those wasps out of there, and get rid of Satan in order to defeat the devil and drive him from his heart. This is why one spits blood from there, 
because that is where he did violence to himself with the prayer in order to defeat the devil and drive him from his heart. It's uh, very serious stuff. Let's see. The inner force of the prayer of the heart oftentimes causes great exhaustion and weakness throughout your body, putting you in danger of falling to the ground like one paralyzed. So whatever this sort of neurophysiological psychosomatic hacking that's happening through this process is very physiologically profound. And it's one of the, the reasons why people need to be very careful about this idea of the, the so-called holy elder. Um, some of them go through these sorts of processes, pl put themselves through extreme uh, asceticism that, that actually does transform their personality. It does do things to their personality that allows them to become very charismatic, very impactful. Um, who knows what sort of hormones that releases throughout the body uh, to, to bring oneself to such extreme states of, of being to where they may fall to the ground like one paralyzed. So the inner force of the prayer of the heart oftentimes causes great exhaustion and weakness. And so whether this is just some sort of uh, action of an unclean spirit or if it's just through this intense psychophysiological concentration and energy that, that causes one to, to respond this way, it, it is not entirely sure, maybe a little bit of both, but it puts one in danger of falling to the ground like one paralyzed. That's not a healthy response. Moreover, when your prayer reaches those levels of perfection, see this, it's it's kind of like giving you this kind of carrot on a stick, you know, it's like leading you through like the promise of greatness, the promise of spiritual exaltation. If you just exhaust yourself a little bit more, if you have just a little bit more pain, I'm sure people have probably died uh, increasing their internal uh, pulmonary pressure, uh, heart pressure, blood pressure, whatever it is, to give themselves some sort of uh, illness, some sort of debilitating disease, whether that's heart attack, stroke, um, pulmonary embolism. Lord have mercy. Please uh, be very careful of Eastern Orthodox t uh, teaching on prayer. I, I've, I've written on the subject. The particular book I wrote on theosis deals with this and actually seeks to kind of correct uh, this uh this, this uh, profound distortion and align it with the principles of the gospel, the principle of, of God's grace and how grace operates through, through the sanctification process. So when your prayer reaches those levels of perfection, anger completely disappears from within you. And I just kind of want to just read real quick. I can't help it from uh, Colossians because he says here, when your prayer reaches those levels of perfection, this asceticism, um, this extreme asceticism, he says, anger completely disappears from within you. But the word of God says in Colossians 2, it says, These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility or asceticism, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. No value um, against, against such things. And it doesn't really deal with the passions. It uh, it it's it's like an it's like trying to create like a gigantic wave that exhausts you and tires you out so much that it creates the uh, appearance that your passions are subsided. But if you stop with this practice, then over time it will come back. These the passions will normally come back because we have the flesh with us. We have the flesh with us until we let drop the flesh at our deaths. So this idea that we're going to uproot anger so completely that it's no longer uh, a part of our experience is, is, is delusion. It says back in Discourse 1 on page 41, it says, If someone prays in this manner for half an hour, then the energy of the prayer of the heart also remains for about half an hour a day or at the most for an entire day, but no longer. So you see that this is like the ascetic, like the false gospel of asceticism, where it's like you create a spiritual impact or it's really a soulical or soulish impact by like uh, um, agitating your, your, your body and your mind to the point where you exhaust yourself, that the passions just don't really have any bodily energy left to kind of impact you. So you have it, it lasts for that long and then it wears off and then your passions come back and you say, oh no, now I need to go pray again. No, that's, that's a false gospel that a person is following. 
The, the gospel doesn't work that way. Sanctification doesn't work that way. The sanctification begins with grace, begins with Christ, doesn't try to end with Christ through these sorts of processes. So here he says, because uh, this teaching here in this particular book puts the cart before the horse, puts the asceticism before Christ. Again, we say that when you reach this degree of perfection in the prayer, pride has no place in you. False. Not even for a moment, for it's immediately dissolved by the prayer, like frost from the warmth of the sun. Jesus, who is meek and humble, now dwells in you, and he imprints, engraves, and stamps your heart with his own seal of meekness and humility. And so they have this false Christ um, that they're teaching that you can acquire through these laborious, physically oriented labors. Christ is at the end of the ascetical journey. That's how you know, and it's a false teaching when it ends in Christ rather than beginning and ending in Christ. Let's see. So it also says, The pain I am speaking about is twofold. We're still in Discourse 5, page 86. The pain I am speaking about is twofold, for you not only physically ache inside at the place where the forceful prayer was being said, but your soul also spiritually aches when you afflict your heart with the prayer. So you create this double action. You know, it's probably how you like work these waves, like the physical affecting the, the solical and the, and the solical affecting the physical. And you work this up until the whole body-mind complex starts to get exhausted. And then what you feel in that exhaustion is this sort of false peace that really is kind of a rest. You're, you can't do anymore. So you almost collapse, almost as if paralyzed. And that's called spirituality according to this paradigm. The physical pain of your heart produces sighing, while the spiritual pain of your soul causes your face to grimace. The sullen and pained look on your face maintains and sustains the pain of your heart. So this kind of back and forth uh, movement here, like this circle. For when you remember your sins and keenly observe the sickness of your nature, you continuously afflict your heart with the prayer. And then it is impossible for you not to become overcome by soul-saving pain of heart. And again, the Orthodox Church will often confuse this with actual salvation. I mean, they're using the word salvation here. Now, they might come back and say, oh, the word salvation has multiple meanings. It can mean total salvation or it can just mean salvation in terms of healing. But if that's what's happening, why are they putting the word salvation here in here all the time uh, rather than healing? Um and it's because there is a confusion there. You may have more sophisticated uh, th uh, theologians or something saying, making these kinds of distinctions, but you, you put these books in most people's hands and they don't see a difference of this kind of salvation. A well-educated evangelical or Catholic is not the person to, to make a comment really here, I think on this point, because they're the ones educated on the dis these fine distinctions that have brought them into orthodoxy uh, through whatever, you know, misunderstanding that they were given. And so, but people who grow up in the church and just listen to the liturgy and, and all that stuff, they're, they're not making these fine distinctions, just as in the prayers to Mary or the fine distinction between venerating icons and worshiping icons, uh, those sorts of things. All of those distinctions are typically lost on uh, even normally catechized um, uh, orthodox Christians. And you know, not, not to say that that's true of all Orthodox Christians. Uh, this isn't to accuse Orthodox Christians in mass of being totally ignorant, but, but having uh, ministered in, in more than one Orthodox uh, setting, I can, I can tell you that the extent of catechesis is, is often frighteningly low. And um, I hope that they learn to return uh, to the simplicity of the gospel and reject uh, teachings as found in here because here they confuse salvation with asceticism. So this pain of heart, literal physical pain, increases in proportion to the force of the prayer of the heart. For when you force your heart with the prayer, especially for a long time, then you perceive a great and sustained pain within you. And you vividly understand that death awaits man, because you're actually bringing yourself physiologically close to death. This is, it's like you're trying to pr produce the sensations of the dying process uh, into you uh, so that you actually, like cr whatever those hormones are created when a person gets near death, it's like it's trying to, to, to excite that within the person. It's a fascinating kind of psychosomatic uh, hacking here. Um, 
and you vividly understand that death awaits man, the pain indicates nothing else except the remembrance of death. You feel death from this pain, but how do you feel it? You feel it not as something which is far off or uncertain, but as something near and certain. It's not an accident here. This, this internal force and pressure that's spitting up blood, is it's, there's something dangerous happening in the body. Uh, the pain that has seized you is related to your breathing. For with every breath of air you take, you experience sharp pain within. The forceful prayer of the heart cup, uh, or cut up the inner parts of your chest so much that it caused a severe and spiritual wound. When the air that you have breathed in passes through those parts and approaches the wound of your heart or your chest, you experience severe pain. Sometimes when your pain increases and grows, you experience the pain even two and three times greater during a single breath. In one of my previous videos, I talked about like this kind of like football field analogy, or I gave this football field analogy where it's like you're the evangelical or you're like a new age mystical person and you've read the Philokalia or you've read, you know, the, the way of the pilgrim and you want to find out about orthodox spirituality and, and you go to your local priest and in, you know, in a nearby church and they give you this kind of like sugary language, you know, uh, you know, this, this kind of like soft peddling of, of what orthodoxy really teaches. Like this is the end zone material. This is like, they might be giving you the 20 yard line answer or the 30 yard line answer or the, the even the 70 yard line answer. But this is what they're reading. This is the advanced teaching. This is the, the 90 yard line, 95 yard line. This is what they're doing on Mount Athos. Mount Athos is, met, is said to be the bastion of, of orthodox orthodoxy, of, of authentic orthodoxy comes out of, of Athos. And this is like a Mount Athos textbook. Uh, so, it just shows the sort of things that are, are concealed from people's eyes in Eastern Orthodox uh, evangelization and why they need the gospel so dearly. Um, let's see. What else could you hope for from death? What else do you expect? We're on still in Discourse 5, page 87. What else do you expect from your grave? Truly, I say to you, when you have such pain, your death is before your very eyes, literally. And having death before you, at the same time, you have your God before you, your fashioner and creator. Now, I don't know if that's a Freudian slip, but it really does seem like this is just a religion of death. This is just death asceticism uh, because it says having death before you, you have your God before you, your fashioner and creator. It doesn't say Jesus. It doesn't say God here. It doesn't say the Father. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit. It just kind of very plainly says, truly I say to you, when you have such pain, your death is before your very eyes. And having death before you, at the same time, you have your God before you, your fashioner and creator. So this is like a death God, a death cult. I mean, I it's probably a Freudian slip here uh, on their part. I don't think that uh, the author intended to, to, to say that, uh, but it seems quite significant. Um, and here it says, uh, from the pain of the prayer is mixed uh, with divine and ineffable sweetness. So it's promising you this sweetness. It's promising. Just keep pushing. Just keep pushing into the depth of this pain. Keep spitting up blood. This is all a good sign to you, feeling like you're exhausted and may fall down paralyzed. Uh, that these are good signs. There's pain. There's pleasure and sweetness awaiting you on the other side of all of this because death is before you, your fashioner and your creator. Yikes. Um, page 88, forcing your heart with the prayer, pain comes. The pain causes you to remember the pains and sufferings of Christ. When you co-suffer with Christ, you also hope to be glorified together with him. So here they kind of like really distort this gospel of what it means to be co-crucified or co-buried or co-risen or co-enthroned with Christ. So if you die with this pain, you will be glorified with Christ. So really it's just, it's trying to push you towards like the, the edge of your existence, exciting these kind of like brain hormonal changes at what happens when this is what it means to worship according to the elemental spirits. When Paul is trying to warn people, when he says, um, 
let's see in chapter two now i now this i say lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men which this book is this this book here is um according to the basic principles of the world like that's what this that's what this is you're you're manipulating the soul you're manipulating the body and these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion false humility and neglect of the body abuse of the body but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh uh, let's see the preciousness and sweetness of the name of Christ is understood and known only by those who have the pain of the prayer within them so if you think that you know any sweetness in Christ apparently you do not know that yet until you've gone through this process so the person who eats earthly bread without the pain of the prayer of the heart and without bitter and deep sighing does not feel the goodness power and energy of the name of christ so in other words christ is in really meaningful ways inaccessible according to this paradigm unless you're going through this process this sort of like self-imposed near-death process in other words he becomes indifferent towards the salvation of his soul but the person whose heart soul and chest ache from the force of the prayer from sighing and from the invisible and visible temptations he experiences and endures out of love for Christ when he hears the name of our Lord Jesus Christ or when he meditates upon it with inner pain or when he calls upon it with living faith and fervent reverence, such a person feels the power of the name of Christ, which activates his divine energy within him. So in other words, that, that the energy of God is not given to a person by which we defeat sin. We, we manipulate our natural energies in order to acquire the energy of God. An utter distortion of the gospel. Um, let's see. What else could all these things mean and express except the intimacy of the soul with Christ and that the name of Christ works this way in the person whose heart aches from the force of the prayer? What else could all these things mean? It, it could also mean prelist. It could also mean spiritual delusion, obsession. Um, it's, uh, it's very, very dangerous because it sounds so spiritual. It sounds like you're using the name of Christ. We're using love of Christ. And when you're an evangelical, you go to the, or they go to the Orthodox Church because they think they're going to love Christ more. But somehow there's something that of the movement of the motion from the evangelical church, from the gospel, let's just say the gospel itself, into the Orthodox church where Christ is not seen as enough. Christ has not become the solution. Christ has not become the answer. It's now all of a sudden I need something more. I need some sort of support. Now, often, sadly, our churches uh, aren't supporting other our fellow Christians with corporate discipleship or discipleship, um, sometimes lack of clarity, sometimes there's superficiality in our churches. But please don't abandon the gospel by entering into these false paradigms and false systems. Um, let's see. Here's one of these beautiful passages that you'll find in here that kind of lures people in. The words, my Christ, my Christ, are never absent from his mouth, mind, heart, and soul. And that's the heart of a Christian. The heart of a Christian always wants to have the name of Jesus on his lips. He just does. He just does. So you read this and it's like, oh, this is such beautiful, this is such a beautiful sentiment. This is what I want. He says, my Christ, my Christ, more often than he breathes. The words, my Christ, proceed and anticipate wherever he looks and whatever he looks at. Whatever he hears, my Christ is heard sooner. Wherever he goes and walks, my Christ goes before him. When he sleeps, my Christ sleeps with him. When he eats, my Christ eats with him. When he labors, my Christ is the preferred work. That is the heart of a Christian. But you don't need this paradigm in order to have it. You can have it because he gives it to you freely. Just keep following hard after him. Just keep living in the light of the cross. Just keep practicing your daily morning and evening prayers. Just keep attending church on Sunday. Just keep reading your Bible daily. Just keep spending more time with the Lord. Just please do, do something like this rather than falling for these sort of false deceptive systems that, that promise you the world, they promise you spiritual riches, and they do not deliver this hamster wheel of asceticism. 
The pain is severe to the body, but paradise to the soul. So now it gets you in this sort of like, um, I don't know if it's like a codependent abuse sort of situation where it says the pain is severe to the body, but paradise to the soul. So now it's like, it, you know, this hurts you, but it's good for you. Learn to love it. Learn, the, learn to love the pain. Lord have mercy. For when the heart aches from the pain of the prayer, the soul rejoices and is at rest, or the soul rejoices and rests. And when the pain is relaxed, the body rests, but the soul is saddened. So when the pain goes down, the soul is saddened because the mystical table of divine gladness and inexpressible delight has been taken away because the physical pain has been lessened. So the pain is actually the index of spiritual advancement. That's the measure of the spiritual advancement. So the soul becomes sad if the pain decreases. So keep yourself at a heightened pitch of pain and a physiological exhaustion, exhaustion, mental exhaustion, and that's the soul's rest. That's the promise of this false asceticism. The pain manifests itself within the heart with the force of the prayer. Let's see. And when the body too has sufficiently wept with the soul, the soul is assured that Christ has listened to it and has written it into the book of eternal life. So all this is assurance. This is this is the, full, the, the method of assurance in the Eastern Orthodox Church, according to this uh, Athenite teaching, that it's this, it's this if, you, if you've wept, if you've had this pain, if you've gone through this process, you've gotten near death, that, 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 that is what produces assurance. And because they, it gets associated with physiological hormonal responses in the body, it, it starts to trigger an association and it traps people in this way psychologically. It's how people self-enslave themselves uh, to something apart from Christ, these systems of asceticism. Let's see. This pain is a great gift from God given to those who struggle and love him. So if you love him, you'll hurt yourself for him. Yikes. Without this pain, one can neither see God spiritually in this world, that is in ecstasy, a dream, or divine vision. So they're promoting that you kind of have like these are good things to aim for uh, nor can you be assured or convinced that he will be with God in the other world so it's a complete works-based salvation uh, assurance system uh, I only know that I love God and that I will be with him if I go and undergo all of this pain uh, and we just see over and over again displayed here this form of deception this pain is born from a crushed and humbled heart this pain destroys the passions. False. The Holy Spirit undoes the passions by his grace. Let's see. They call it the soul-saving pain of heart. Let's see. Moving into Discourse 6. That was all from Discourse 5. Kind of the central. Yeah, basically the central um, chapter in here. Let's see. Persist in the prayer of the heart until a wound forms within you at the spot where you repeat the prayer. Now, remember, this is physical. This wasn't just spiritual. So it's actually advocating to pray with such force that you give yourself a wound. Let's see. As you mystically supplicate all the saints with your mind and a warm heart, you begin with the Panagia. That's the, uh, the, the mother of God, the Blessed Virgin Mary. And then pass through all the orders of the saints with your mind. Like this is just kind of like that Gnostic system of generations. So you go through the ranks of angels. or You go through the ranks of the saints. Let's not call it the ranks of angels. Let's call it the ranks of saints. And then we'll just kind of slip our way into, the, into Christianity. When your mind arrives at the rank to which the saint who visited you belongs, you begin to experience some spiritual comfort. And certain obvious signs appear that inform you the, uh, the friend whom you seek and who visited you is near. So this is like kind of like a way of conjuring familiar spirits. Um, please be very careful. This is, this is very, very dangerous. And it passes under the, the name of spirituality. I mean, Paul expressly, expressly warns against this where he says, Let's see. Talks about uh, generations. I probably won't find it. Oh, yeah. Don't let anyone cheat you. Let no one 
cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his uh, fleshly mind. This is from that's Colossians 2.18, but I like the translation from the ESV here as well, where it says, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels. Here, this book presents it in the form of saints, but it does talk about the visions. I mean, we, if you recall, we just mentioned about someone wouldn't be able to have visions if they don't follow this path. So here, Paul is expressly warning against this very spirituality, which is at the heart of Athenite um, uh, spiritual teaching. Insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason, by his sensuous mind. And that's exactly what this whole thing is. It's the sensual sort of spirituality, uh, sensual asceticism, pain of heart. It's, very, it's, it's about senses, what you feel, what you internally generate through physiological um, intensification. As you supplicate each saint individually, whose life you have read and whose miracles you have heard about, when you say the saint's name that visited you, it becomes obvious that it was that particular saint because of the active energy and obvious signs of rich, spontaneous compunction and spiritual warmth you experience. It's like a textbook on being visited by unclean spirits. Let's see. How to be, how to commune with unclean spirits. Discourse 9, the extreme exhaustion of, heart, of the heart which is caused by the intensity of the heart's forceful prayer. Whoever wishes to achieve this extreme exhaustion of the internal and external state of the body, or rather whoever wishes to reach the degree and state of the Holy Fathers, so it's, this is what the Holy Fathers did. This is what the Holy Fathers teach. No, it's it's not. My, my book that I wrote shows that quite clearly. Um Eastern Orthodoxy has very much corrupted the gospel, but you can still find pockets of it and streams of it in various areas. Um, unfortunately, because of the Seventh Ecumenical Council, they've confused the gospel formally. And it's incorrigible, mean it's means it's incorrectable. They can't get rid of the they can't repent of the Seventh Ecumenical Council, which makes it a false system uh, in total. But but in terms of individuals, there are gospel believing individuals within Orthodox churches. But that's for sure. Let's see. In order for his soul and heart to taste somewhat God's grace in proportion to his exhaustion, two things are necessary, fasting and the prayer of the heart as he teaches this forceful prayer. So in other words, grace is received in proportion to your exhaustion. So the more exhausted you, you make yourself through this prayer, the more grace you receive, except God gives his grace freely. It's undeserved. It's undeserved. You don't have to wrestle. If you're in the Orthodox Church, you know, this video is not for Orthodox Christians per se, um, but if you're Orthodox and you're tempted to come out, I mean, please, the, you don't need to wrestle like this for the grace of God. You don't need to wrestle like this for, for assurance of, of salvation. Page 118, when a person uh, who is fasting forces his heart in noetic prayer so much that he experiences pain of heart, physical heart, in his depths, he is then overcome by extreme exhaustion, both within and without. The extreme exhaustion powerfully cuts and enervates, weakens every external and internal carnal pleasure found hidden within a person's body. St. Paul's condemned this method, and yet this is being given as uh, a, pri a primary, as the way, the ideal way. Unless a man's heart is mixed with the restful and peaceful name of our Lord Jesus Christ, he cannot achieve spiritual rest and peace. So, but what he means here, that's like a nice phrase. Unless a man's heart is mixed with the restful and peaceful name of our Lord Jesus Christ, he cannot achieve spiritual rest and peace. So people who drunk the, the Orthodox Kool-Aid, like the, like the, the Kool-Aid Orthodoxy, it, you read this sentence and you're like, oh yeah, see, it's about being peaceful and restful. But he's defined in here what he means. It's this pain of heart. It's exhaustion, physiological exhaustion. So unless you've mixed the name of Christ in this way, you cannot achieve spiritual rest and peace. You can't take this nice phrase out and select it and say this is what he means without understanding what he means by the phrase, how he defines it very clearly. 
Here he asks some questions for your ability to kind of reflect on whether or not you're doing it right. So he gives like almost like a little catechetical sort of self check inventory thing uh, towards the end of the book in Discourse 16. So he asks um, number 57, did your heart ache from the force of the prayer? Okay. So you have to ask yourself, did your heart ache from the force of the prayer? So he says, what that means is then your heart felt divine protection and grace. So the heart aching means divine protection and grace. Number 58, was your heart pained and cut by the forceful prayer? That means you quickly saw a divine vision with your spiritual eyes. Number 59, were you fearful for your life because of the aching of your crushed heart? If you were, if you in, were so intense that you were afraid for your life, that means a hidden mystery of God was revealed to you. It's like a fortune cookie. Um, a hidden mystery of God was revealed to you, like the magic eight ball. Did this happen? What does it say? Oh, I must have received a mystical revelation from God. Ah, uh, call nine one one. Let's see, number sixty two. Did you give blood from your heart? You spitting it up. Your soul received the Holy Spirit. So that's how you know, according to this paradigm, that you've received the Holy Spirit if you're actually giving blood from your heart. Did a dry, number 65, did a dry cough seize your chest because of the force of the prayer? That means Satan became severely ill, anguished by your anguish. Keep it up. You might defeat Satan through your forceful prayer. Oh, you're spitting up blood a little bit more. Let's see. Was your voice cut off because of the immeasurable force of the prayer of your heart? Number 66. That means your soul sang a heavenly, incomprehensible, and sweet song. So if you lose your voice because you've, you're hurting yourself, that means your soul sang a heavenly, incomprehensible, and sweet song. 67. Did your voice lose its tone because of the crushing of your heart? That means you heard an unbelievable, angelic song sweetly sung to Jesus, your fashioner. Um, this is how people really live in states of delusion. They live kind of like alone on these mountains, uh, on, on Athos and these hills, these wilderness areas, and they just kind of produce this stuff. It's like the yogis in caves in India, just like figuring out stuff that they can kind of do and figure it out. And, you know, in this case, because they have a Bible or they celebrate something they call the divine liturgy there, that that just kind of like approves it. And how do they uh, ultimately find out that they uh, prove it? I'll share that next after I just give this one on Discourse 18, where it uh, uh, talks about the sacrifice of the mass, basically. It says, when the worthy and purest priest enters the holy altar in order to sacrifice the Son of God to his heavenly God and Father. So here we find an Orthodox author, a hieromonk from Mount Athos, talking about how when communion is celebrated the, the priest sacrifices christ that's that false catholic teaching that we know about um so here's how he was guaranteed in his mind the truth of this and it falls directly under saint paul's uh condemnation here but he says on the preceding day in the evening i had done a lot of physical labor i was very exhausted his chest had not yet healed let's see sighing with this ache on his death. Then he saw a vision of our Lord Jesus Christ, our infinitely longed for and sweetest hierarch, clad in hierarchical vestments and celebrating the liturgy exactly according to the order of the church. So apparently he was practicing the liturgy. Jesus in his vision was practicing the liturgy according to the Eastern Rite developments that came after the Byzantification of the church when they adopted more of those ori uh, Oriental kingly rites. Uh, from from, the, from the, the Asia Minor there and the ancient world and the eastern half of the Roman Empire when they started developing all of these vestments and the, and the liturgy was modified in the various ways um, up through, I don't know, I think it was through the 8th, 9th century when it was kind of fine, the liturgy was finally frozen in its development. So apparently Christ in his vision was practicing the liturgy according to, to the, wearing those vestments and according to that order. Um, and Christ, paradoxically, was both the offerer and the one being offered. This is page 230. Flipping over to 232. So I spoke with great humility and hesitation. Tell me, Lord, what was the simple book, this book here, that I wrote concerning noetic prayer written with your grace or not? Well, tell me, was the simple book that I wrote concerning noetic prayer written with your grace or not? And he said to me, yes, 
It was written with my grace. And I spoke again. How can I know, Lord, that it was written with your grace? The Savior said to me, from the compunction that came to you as you were writing. So he's using his feelings as the guide together with this vision. This is exactly the kind of thing he says, vainly puffed, puffed up by his fleshly mind. I like how the ESV translates this as well. According to the elemental spirits, let's see, puffed up without reason, with uh, without reason by his sensuous mind, and uh, elsewhere he, uh, with this asceticism, and elsewhere it talks about things like uh, uh, visions, things that he's not actually not actually seen. I recommend reading uh, Colossians chapter 2 uh, very closely as to a way to guard yourself against the, this Athenite paradigm. Let's see. When you were writing and were filled with compunction and wept, then it was my Holy Spirit speaking in you. When you were writing and were filled with a little compunction, then it was just a visitation of my grace. And when that grace was taken from you, the compunction you were feeling immediately ceased. And so you were no longer able to write with a free intellect. So he was communing. He was exhausting himself physically and physiologically and communing <clears throat> with these familiar spirits and receiving impressions so that he was able to write from this altered state of consciousness, apparently. So this is this uh, teaching here. My The last two teachings and the one on icons I dealt with the false system of external worship in the Orthodox Church, the Mariology, their false system of, of mediation with their uh, Mariology, and here with their false system of internal uh, spirituality and sanctification. So I hope this is edifying to you. I hope it warns you and alerts you to the dangers, the very real dangers uh, that exist, uh, spiritual dangers that exist within the Eastern Orthodox Church, according to their spiritual paradigm. paradigm. Uh, thank you again. God bless you. May you be kept by the grace of the gospel in Christ alone, uh, keeping your eyes on him. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. Glory to Jesus Christ.